Kairete and Salwete. I'm so sorry for hijacking this broadcast, since I know you all must be chomping at the bit to hear our gracious host talk about a bunch of math hippies like the Pythagoreans, or the strange creature that is a featherless biped with broad flat nails. But please, lend me your ears. My name is Derek, and I am the host of the Hellenistic Age podcast. Some of you may be familiar with the term, but for those who aren't, I'll explain. The Hellenistic Age is the era between the death of Alexander the Great to the rise of Augustus Caesar, 323 to 31 BC, a time where Greek culture spread and fused with the various civilizations and customs of Eurasia and North Africa. Now, I am not a historian, nor am I a classicist. In fact, my background is biology and philosophy. But I am a deeply devoted fan of the ancient world, who loves to learn and teach others about it. I am also admittedly a self-professed Roman fanboy, but the Hellenistic world is so fascinating that I couldn't help but study it further. In this podcast, we will take a journey from the shores of the Italian peninsula to the mountains of the Hindu Kush, from the steppes of northern Afghanistan to the deserts of Egypt. Want something political? Look no further than the wars of the Diadochoi, which one scholar calls, quote, the world's greatest funeral games, the prize, empire. Looking for the fantastical? There are the superstructures like the Tesseracontaries, a ship built by King Ptolemy IV of Egypt that was as long as one and a half football fields and needed 4,000 rowers just to move it. Perhaps you want something more culturally focused. Well, we will learn the transformation of the lion-skin-clad Heracles into the Japanese Kongorikishi, guardian of the Buddha, and the various mixing of religions and philosophies of the West and East. I could go on, but I think my pitch is overstaying its welcome. If you want to learn more, please check out my podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. And you can also follow me on Twitter for show updates or to just drop me a line at Hellenistic P.O.D. So, please enjoy this episode of the History of Ancient Greece. But, I hope to see you all in next time in the next episode of the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Hello, my name is Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 85, Mathematics and Early Pythagoreans. Today's episode is brought to you by our new November Patreon supporters, Juan Camilo Rodriguez, Andrew, N.A. Jordens, and James Welsh, as well as PayPal donors, Ricardo Carvalho, and Robin Alday. Once again, I do apologize if I didn't pronounce those correctly, but I do thank you for your donations and support of the podcast. If you too would like to support the History of Ancient Greece, you can become a monthly Patreon supporter or a one-time donor at PayPal. Links to the various sites are in the show notes. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. The origins of Greek mathematics are not well documented and therefore are not well understood. While the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations of the Bronze Age possessed writing and were capable of advanced engineering, as we have seen in episodes 5 and 6, they left behind no documents explaining mathematical concepts, and so we cannot say for any certainty what sort of mathematical principles that they were working with and which sort of discoveries they were responsible for. And even though that would change when we get to the Archaic period, and writing once again was found in Greece, Greek mathematical writing generally lagged behind the Greek literary tradition. There was some, but very little is known firsthand from this period, as nearly all of the evidence was passed down through later authors. So it can be difficult to ascertain the fidelity of their commentary for the outlook of the original thinker. Nevertheless, it is clear that from the earliest stages, the Greeks were interested in geometry, 
geometria or geometry literally means taking the measure of the earth from G or earth and metron or measurement. And it became a theoretical and practical science of special importance in archaic Greece, where land was the most valuable commodity. In this endeavor, it is generally assumed that the much older Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations influenced their younger Greek neighbors, probably beginning in Ionia and working its way west and northwards. It's likely for this reason, then, that many of the earliest philosophers and mathematicians were said to have studied in Babylon and Egypt. Regardless, historians traditionally place the beginning of the systematic study of mathematics in Greece to Thales of Miletus, who flourished in the early 6th century BC. We discussed him at length in episode 20. He is the first to whom specific mathematical discoveries have been attributed. According to tradition, he traveled to Egypt, where he obtained an extensive understanding of geometry, not in terms of proofs, a concept which was to be developed later by Pythagoras, but through surveying techniques and general rules. And so to Thales, we owe the earliest mathematical theorems. Although no original work of Thales has survived, according to Euclid, in the third book of his Elements, he was responsible for what ultimately would be named the Thales Theorem, which states that an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. And so, if line AC is the diameter of a circle, and point B is any other point lying on the circle's circumference, then what Thales was able to show was that the angle made by the connecting lines at point B will be a right angle, meaning that it is 90 degrees, using the Mesopotamian system of defining angles. Afterwards, Thales was said to have offered an ox, probably to the god Apollo, as a sacrifice of thanksgiving for the discovery. Although Indian and Mesopotamian mathematicians knew this concept well before Thales, in fact it is believed that Thales learned about it during his travels in Babylon, it is named after him because he was said to be the first to prove the theorem, using his own results that the sum of angles in a triangle is equal to 180 degrees, and that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal. In fact, the word isosceles comes from isos, or equal, and skelos, or leg, so that it means a triangle with two sides, or legs, of equal length. Using his knowledge about angles and triangles, Thales was able to calculate the distance of a ship at sea, based on observations taken from two points on land. He also was able to calculate the height of an Egyptian pyramid, based on the length of the shadow that it cast. Plutarch writes in his Moralia, when discussing the supposed dinner of the seven wise men, which we discussed in episode 19, quote, Without trouble or the assistance of any instrument, he merely set up a stick at the extremity of the shadow cast by the pyramid, and having thus made two triangles by the intercept of the sun's rays, he showed that the pyramid has to the stick the same ratio which the shadow of the pyramid has to the shadow of the stick, end quote. This led Thales to formulate what would become known as the intercept theorem, which states that if two intersecting lines are intercepted, or crossed, by a pair of parallel lines, opposite angles are equal where the two straight lines intersect. Essentially, the corresponding sides of similar triangles stand in constant ratio. It was because of all of these discoveries in his deductive organization of mathematics that Thales is often hailed as the first true mathematician, in addition to being the first natural philosopher. Although it is not known for certain whether or not Thales was the one responsible, within two centuries the Greeks had introduced logical structure and the idea of proof into mathematics. Regardless, it's often credited to Thales because, as we have seen numerous times, the Greeks loved to credit some sole figure with establishing the foundations of their respective discipline. Another important figure in the development of Greek mathematics is Pythagoras. Like Thales, he also traveled to Egypt and Babylon, but then settled in Croton in southern Italy, where he established an order called the Pythagoreans. But following the burning of the Pythagorean meeting place, and their expulsion from Croton around 500 BC, Pythagoras was said to have fled to Tarentum and then to Metapontum, where he ultimately died. In episode 20, we discussed the career of Pythagoras, his teachings, and Pythagoreanism in great detail, so we won't rehash it here, but we will give a brief overview. Pythagoreanism was not only a philosophical school that specialized in mathematics, but also a religious practice, much like the practitioners of Orphism, a religious tradition that developed in parallel to Pythagoreanism, which we discussed in episode 81. As a religious community, the Pythagoreans relied on oral teachings and worshipped Apollo, the oracular god of Delphi. They preached an austere life, 
In the 4th century BC, Greek historian and skeptic philosopher Hecateus of Abdera asserted that Pythagoras had been inspired by Egyptian philosophy in his use of ritual regulations and his belief in reincarnation. Aside from conducting their daily lives according to strict rules, Pythagoreans also engaged in rituals to attain purity. In particular, they believed that as a punishment for a committed offense, a person's soul would be buried deep within their body which acted as a kind of tomb for the soul in this life. But all was not lost, as the soul could be purified, and the highest reward that a human could attain was for their soul to be freed through purification and to join in the life of the gods, thus escaping the cycle of reincarnation into another human being. Scholars typically distinguish between two periods of Pythagoreanism, those being early Pythagoreanism, from the 6th until the 5th century BC, and late Pythagoreanism from the 4th until the 3rd century BC. In this episode, we will focus on the early Pythagoreans, who themselves focused on research and the accumulation of knowledge from the books written by preceding philosophers. One of the most important characteristics of the Pythagorean order was that it maintained that the pursuit of philosophical and mathematical studies was a moral basis for the conduct of life. In fact, the words philosophy, literally the love of wisdom, from philos, love, and sophia, wisdom, and mathematics, or that which is learned from mathema, which means to learn, are said to have been coined by Pythagoras. From this love of knowledge came many achievements, and it has been customarily said that the early Pythagoreans discovered most of the material recorded in the first two books of Euclid's Elements, which he wrote in the latter part of the 4th century BC. Another major source of evidence comes from traditions recorded in much later works, such as Proclus's commentary on Euclid, written in the 5th century AD. Other slightly later works, such as Aristotle's commentary on the Pythagoreans, are themselves only known from a few surviving fragments. And so, distinguishing the work of certain mathematicians is difficult since almost none of their original works survive. In addition, all of the discoveries by individual Pythagoreans were attributed to the collective order. And since in antiquity, it was customary to give all credit to the master, Pythagoras himself was given credit for most of the discoveries made by his order, making it very difficult to discern who actually should be credited with what. Aristotle, though, refused to attribute anything specifically to Pythagoras as an individual, and only discussed the work of the Pythagoreans as a group. Regardless, today, Pythagoras is mostly remembered for his mathematical ideas and by association with the work that the early Pythagoreans did in advancing mathematical concepts and theories on harmonic musical intervals, the definition of numbers, proportions, and mathematical methods, such as arithmetic and geometry. Although many of the mathematical problems that the early Pythagoreans tackled were long known in Egypt and the Near East, historians credit them with developing it into a coherent logical system based on clear definitions and proven theorems that were considered to be a subject worthy of study in its own right, without regard to the practical applications that had been the primary concern of the Egyptians and Mesopotamians. The Pythagoreans, as well as other Greek mathematicians, would push on to make breakthroughs by focusing on the abstract, which brought clarity and precision to age-old mathematical problems. Their solutions provided the fundamental mathematical building blocks that all future mathematicians and scientists would build upon right up to the present day. For example, let's look at the most famous mathematical discovery attributed to Pythagoras, the so-called Pythagorean Theorem. Although modern historians believe that the mathematical concept itself was known to the Mesopotamians and was likely imported from them, the discovery of the theorem was attributed by ancient sources to Pythagoras, because he was said to have been the first to deduce a proof for it. For millennia, the Egyptians, as well as the Mesopotamians, were some of the most superior mathematicians, but they used their mathematical knowledge largely for engineering purposes. Without it, the building of their great pyramids, ziggurats, and other breathtaking monuments would have been impossible. What the Greeks derived from Egyptian mathematics were mainly rules of thumb with specific applications. The Egyptians knew, for example, that a triangle whose sides are in a 3-4-5 ratio is a right triangle. This was because in order to form right angles, the practical-minded Egyptian land surveyors used a rope divided into 12 equal parts, forming a triangle with three parts on one side, four parts on the second side, and five parts on the remaining side. The right angle was to be found where the three-unit side joined the four-unit side. 
This was a very practical method to form right angles, though how the Egyptians came up with this method is not recorded. Neither do we have Egyptian records on further analysis related to this issue. Apparently, their interest went no further than its practical application. But according to tradition, Pythagoras looked at this 3-4-5 triangle and saw in it what nobody else seemed to have noticed, triggering an intellectual revolution of sorts. Based on the 3-4-5 triangle, known to the Egyptians, Pythagoras came up with a mathematical theorem that bears his name, which states that on a right-angled triangle, when the areas of the squares erected on the two smaller sides were added together, they equaled the area of the square erected on the longest side, which is the side opposite the right angle, called the hypotenuse. In other words, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides, or simply put, a squared plus b squared equals c squared where C represents the length of the hypotenuse, and A and B represent the lengths of the triangle's other two sides. This theorem thus shows the development of some very important mathematical techniques, those being abstraction and deductive reasoning, and we owe to Pythagoras, or maybe to his followers, these important Greek innovations in the field of mathematics. Many of the surviving sources on Pythagoras originate with Aristotle and the philosophers of the Peripatetic School. Although Pythagoreanism would have profound influence on Plato, his pupil Aristotle rejected mathematics as a tool for investigation and understanding of the world, since he believed that numbers constituted simply a quantitative determinant and had no ontological value. And so Aristotle's discussion of Pythagorean philosophy is difficult to interpret because he had little patience for their arguments that did not fit with his philosophical doctrine. That's because, at least according to Aristotle, the Pythagoreans used mathematics for solely mystical and abstract reasons, devoid of any sort of practical application. He came to this conclusion partly because the Pythagoreans were convinced that the universe could be described in terms of whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. And so they regarded numerology and geometry as fundamental to understanding the nature of the universe and therefore central to their philosophical and religious ideals and therefore central to their philosophical and religious ideas. And so Pythagoras and his teachings cultivated mathematics in a combination of philosophical theorizing and deductive provable methodology. Numbers for him meant positive integers, but unlike their Greek contemporaries, the Pythagorean philosophers represented numbers graphically, not symbolically through letters. The Pythagoreans also used figures made up of dots, known as sci-fi, or pebbles, to represent numbers and triangles, squares, rectangles, and pentagons. This enabled a visual comprehension of mathematics and allowed for a geometrical exploration of numerical relationships. In doing so, the Pythagoreans investigated the geometric relationship of numbers exhaustively. They defined perfect numbers as those that were equal to the sum of all their divisors. For example, 6 both equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, and also can be divided by 1, 2, and 3. Likewise, 28 both equals 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14, and can also be divided by 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14. The theory of odd and even numbers was also central to Pythagorean arithmetic. The distinction was both direct and visual, as the Pythagoreans arranged triangular dots so that the even and odd numbers successfully alternate, 2, 4, 6, and 3, 5, 7, and so forth. The Pythagoreans believed that there was a close relationship between numbers and geometrical forms, and so they engaged with geometry to establish principles and allow theorems to be explored abstractly and mentally. Early Pythagoreans not only proved simple geometric theorems, including such principles as the sum of the angles of a triangle equals two right angles, or 180 degrees, but also came up with three of the five regular polyhedra, those being the tetrahedron, which has four faces, the cube, which has six faces, and the dodecahedron, which has 12 faces. The other two, the octahedron, which has eight faces, and the icosahedron, which has 20 faces, would be discovered later by Theotetus, a contemporary of Plato. These are the five three-dimensional figures that have the same number of faces meeting at each vertex. For example, if you look at a cube at any vertex, there will be three faces meeting it. Additionally, the sides of a regular dodecahedron, a polyhedra with 12 faces, are all regular pentagons, which for the Pythagoreans symbolized health. They also revered the pentagram, which is a five-pointed star that is formed by drawing a continuous line in five straight segments. The pentagram has often been used as a mystic and magical symbol, as each diagonal divides the two others at the golden ratio. 
When linear geometric figures, such as these, replace the dots, the combination of Mesopotamian algebra and Pythagorean arithmetic provided the basis for early Greek mathematics. By attempting to establish a system of rules, the early Pythagoreans helped to establish strict, axiomatic procedures for solving mathematical problems. Early Pythagoreans also believed that mathematics could help in addressing important philosophical problems, and so for them, numbers became related to intangible concepts, since all things were made of numbers. In fact, the generation of numbers was related to objects of geometry and ultimately cosmogony. According to St. Hippolytus of Rome, a 3rd century AD theologian, the Pythagoreans believed that the number one, or the monad, from the Greek monis, meaning single, was the first thing that came into existence, and thus represented the origin of all things, and as such was related to the intellect and being. And so the circle dot was used to represent the monad as the first metaphysical being. According to Diogenes Laertes, the monad then bore the number two, or the dyad, which represented matter or thought. Aristotle equated matter as the formation of energy into the material world, as the static material was formed by the energies being acted upon by force or motion. Later Neoplatonic philosophers like Plotinus treated the dyad as the divine mind that caused matter to appear or become perceivable. And so from the dyad would come the rest of the numbers which itself bore in succession, those being points, lines, two-dimensional entities, three-dimensional entities, and the four essential elements, earth, water, fire, and air, from which the rest of the world is built up. The number three, or the triad, representing harmony, was symbolically seen as an ideal number, and the Pythagoreans believed that the whole world and all things in it are summed up in this number because it had a beginning, middle, and end, and was the smallest number of points that could be used to define a triangle, which they revered as a symbol of the god Apollo. The triad had an ethical dimension too, as the goodness of each person was believed to be the threefold qualities of prudence, drive, and good fortune. The number four, or the tetrad, representing the cosmos, signified the four seasons and the four elements, and was related to justice, because two times two and two plus two both equal four evenly. The number five represented marriage, because it was the sum of two, the dyad, representing matter, and three, the ideal triad with its beginning, middle, and end. The number seven was also considered to be sacred because it was the number of strings on a lyre and because Apollo's birthday was celebrated on the seventh day of each month. Seven was also symbolic since it was the number of planets in classical astronomy, which excluded the Earth as a planet, but held the planets to be all seven of the large stars that were visible to the naked eye, the sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. It wasn't until the 18th and 19th centuries that Uranus, Neptune, and the various dwarf planets would be discovered. We will discuss astronomy next episode. Anyways, finally, the number 10, or the decade, was regarded as the perfect number, and the Pythagoreans honored it by never gathering in groups larger than 10. Similarly, Pythagoras was also credited with devising the Tetractus, an equilateral triangle formed from the sequence of the first ten numbers aligned in four rows. One point on the top, a row of two, then a row of three, and finally a row of four on the bottom. Like the pentagram, the tetractus is both a mathematical idea and a metaphysical symbol that embraces within itself the principles of the natural world, the harmony of the cosmos, and the mysteries of the divine. And so the Pythagoreans regarded the Tetractus as a symbol of utmost mystical importance in their secret worship, because for them it was associated with planetary motions and music. Representing the organization of space, the first row represented zero dimensions, as a point. The second represented one dimension, as a line of two points. The third row represented two dimensions, as a triangle of three points. And the fourth row represented three dimensions as a tetrahedron of four points. A prayer of the Pythagoreans shows the importance of the tetractus, sometimes called the mystic tetrad, as the prayer was addressed to it, quote, Bless us, divine number, thou who generated gods and men, O holy, holy tetractus, which contains the root and source of the eternally flowing creation. For the divine number begins with the profound, pure unity until it comes to the holy four, 
Then it begets the mother of all, the all-comprising, all-bounding, the firstborn, the never-swerving, the never-tiring holy ten, the keyholder of all, end quote. Ian Blickus, in his Life of Pythagoras, states that the Tetractus was so admiral and so divinized by those who understood it, that Pythagorean initiates would swear oaths by it to the one who brought this gift to humanity, meaning Pythagoras. They then served as novices for a period of silence, lasting five years. Early Pythagorean sects were closed societies bound by secrets, and so the home of a Pythagorean was known as the site of mysteries. New Pythagoreans were chosen based on merit and discipline. Ancient sources record that following the aforementioned sworn oath to the Tetractus, early Pythagoreans underwent a five-year initiation period in which they only listened to the teachings, or akousmata, in silence with no talking. After this period was over, initiates could be tested to become members of the inner circle. It's not stated how they were tested, though. Pythagoreans also had the opportunity to leave the community whenever they wished, though this was probably rare. It was even customary that family members also became initiates, as Pythagoreanism developed into a philosophical tradition that entailed rules for everyday life. And so women were able to study as Pythagorean philosophers. In fact, Iamblichus, a Neoplatonist philosopher of the 3rd century AD, listed 235 Pythagoreans by name, and among them were 17 women who he described as the most famous women practitioners of Pythagoreanism. While this number may seem minuscule, most other philosophical traditions did not allow women, so it is significant in that regard. In addition, the biographical tradition on Pythagoras holds that his mother, wife, and daughters were part of his inner circle. Many of the surviving texts of women Pythagoreans are part of a collection known as Pseudoepigraphia Pythagorica, which was compiled by Neo-Pythagoreans in the 1st or 2nd century AD. However, only some of the surviving fragments of this collection are by early Pythagorean women, while the bulk of surviving fragments are from late Pythagorean women who wrote in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. In addition, female Pythagoreans are some of the first female philosophers from which texts have survived. For example, Theano of Croton, who was the wife of Pythagoras, is considered a major figure in the development of early Pythagoreanism after her husband's death. She was noted as a distinguished philosopher, and in the lore that surrounds her, is said to have taken over the leadership of the school after his death. None of the writings attributed to Theano have survived, though, except a few fragments in letters of uncertain authorship. According to later accounts, the children variously ascribed to Pythagoras and Theano were all Pythagorean philosophers themselves. They include three daughters, Erignote, Damo, and Maya, who married the famous athlete, Milo of Croton, and a son, Telagos, who later sources would say was a teacher of Empedocles, perhaps in an attempt to link Empedocles to Pythagoras. According to Iamblichus, following Pythagoras' death, disputes about his teachings led to the development of two entirely different philosophical traditions within Pythagoreanism itself. These two groups later became known as the Akousmatikoi, or the listeners, and the Mathematikoi, or the learners. The Akousmatikoi are traditionally identified by scholars as a sort of the old guard who believed in mysticism, numerology, and Pythagoras' religious teachings whereas the Mathematikoi are traditionally identified as a more intellectual, modernist faction, who were more rationalistic and scientific. Hippasus was an initiated Pythagorean philosopher who flourished in the early 5th century BC, and who was said to be the founder of the Mathematikoi. Little was known about his life and his beliefs, though. Most ancient authors say that he was born in Metapontum, though others say that he was from the nearby city of Croton, Regardless, both cities have been identified with Pythagoras and were Pythagorean strongholds. According to some traditions, Hippasus left behind no writings, but according to another, he was the author of a treatise called the Mystic Discourse, which was written in order to discredit Pythagoras' teachings. While this may be true, it also could be a later invention by members of the Akousmatikoi to conveniently give a reason as to why there was a split in the Pythagorean tradition. This may be the case because, although the practitioners of Mathematikoi recognized the practitioners of Akousmatikoi as fellow Pythagoreans, but because the Mathematikoi allegedly followed the teachings of Epasis and not Pythagoras, the Akousmatikoi philosophers did not officially recognize them. Despite this, both groups are regarded as simply being Pythagoreans by other contemporary philosophical schools.
Some scholars, though, believe that there probably was not a sharp distinction between the two groups and that many Pythagoreans probably believed the two approaches were compatible. Regardless, the practitioners of akousmatikoi believed that humans had to act in appropriate ways. Akousmata, translated as oral sayings, preserved all sayings of Pythagoras as divine dogma. The tradition of the Kuzmatikoi thus resisted any reinterpretation or philosophical evolution of Pythagoras' teachings. Individuals who by their actions attained the most Akuzmata were thus regarded as wise. Furthermore, the Akuzmatikoi refused to recognize that the continuous development of mathematical and scientific research conducted by the Mathematikoi was in line with Pythagoras' intention. Until the demise of Pythagoreanism in the 4th century BC, the Akuzmatikoi continued to engage in a pious life by practicing silence, dressing simply, and avoiding meat for the purpose of attaining a privileged afterlife, and they engaged deeply in questions of Pythagoras' moral teachings concerning matters such as harmony, justice, ritual purity, and moral behavior. On the other hand, the practitioners of the Mathematikoi acknowledged the religious underpinning of Pythagoreanism and engaged in mathema, translated as learning or studying, as part of their practice. While their scientific pursuits were largely mathematical, they also promoted other fields of scientific study in which Pythagoras had engaged during his lifetime. A sectarianism thus developed between the dogmatic Akousmatikoi and the Mathematikoi, who in their intellectual activism became regarded as increasingly progressive. In doing so, the Mathematikoi claimed that numbers were at the heart of everything, as we discussed earlier, and used that theory to construct a new view of the cosmos. In their tradition of Pythagoreanism, the Earth was removed from the center of the universe, as they believed that the Earth, along with other celestial bodies, orbited around a central fire. This, they believed, resembled a celestial harmony. In fact, Aristotle in his Metaphysics says that Hippasus held the element of fire to be the cause of all things. And Sextus Empiricus contrasts Aristotle with the Pythagoreans in this respect, since he believed the RK to be material, whereas they thought it was something intangible, namely that it was a number. Diogenes Laertes tells us that Hippasus believed that there is a definite time which the changes in the universe take to complete, and that the universe is limited and ever in motion. We will discuss the Pythagorean astronomical system more on the next episode. In addition, a scolion on Plato's Phaedo notes Hippasus as an early experimenter in music theory, claiming that he made use of bronze discs to discover the fundamental musical ratios of 4-3, 3-2, and 2-1. According to Plutarch, this Pythagorean musical system was based on the Tetractus, as the rows can be read as the ratios of 4-3, perfect fourth, 3-2, perfect fifth, and two one octave, forming the basic intervals of the Pythagorean musical scales. And now, let's take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring can be pretty time-consuming. You post a job to several online job boards, only to get tons of the wrong resumes. Then you have to sort through all of those resumes just to find a few people with the right skills and experience. Those job sites that overwhelm you with the wrong resumes, they're not smart. That's why you should do the smart thing and go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter finds qualified candidates for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes to identify people with the right skills, education, and experience, and actively invites them to apply to your job. So you get qualified candidates fast. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. This rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. If you love this show, show your support to it and ZipRecruiter by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash G-R-E-E-C-E. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And now... Let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. After the proof for the Pythagorean theorem was established, either by Pythagoras himself or one of his Mathematikoi followers, they quickly came up against what would be a serious mathematical problem. If we had a square with each side one unit in length, and we also had a second square with double the area of the first square, how would the side of the second square compare to the side of the first square? This is the origin of the question regarding the square root of 2. 
Geometrically speaking, the square root of 2 is the length of a diagonal across a square with two sides each of one unit of length. In other words, using the Pythagorean theorem, in a triangle whose two sides are both 1, then the hypotenuse would be the square root of 2, or the square root of 2 squared equals 1 squared plus 1 squared. We know today that the square root of 2 is an irrational number, which means that it cannot be expressed as a ratio of integers. However, the Greeks were not aware of this, so they kept trying to solve this riddle in order to come up with a valid, rational answer. The then-current Pythagorean method would have claimed that there must be some sufficiently small, indivisible unit that could fit evenly into one of these lengths, as well as the other. Try as they might, though, the Pythagoreans could not solve the puzzle, and they finally faced up to the reality that no ratio of two whole numbers could express the value of the square root of 2. Tradition says that it was either Pythagoras himself or Hippasus who deduced that the diagonal of a square is incommensurable with its side, meaning it was not able to be judged by the same standard since it cannot be expressed as a whole number. Since it is not a whole number, but a ratio, which is a rational number, the square root of 2 is irrational. In fact, it was probably the square root of 2 that was the first number known to be irrational. Greek mathematicians termed this incommensurable ratio as a logos, or inexpressible. Regardless of who discovered it, the secret of irrational numbers was carefully kept by the early Pythagoreans, as its discovery created a sort of crisis in the very roots of Pythagorean beliefs. Since irrational numbers were an element in the universe which denied the doctrine that all phenomena in the universe can be reduced to whole numbers and their ratios. There is also an interesting account, its historical accuracy is not certain, correlating the death of Hypsasis with irrational numbers. Either the discovery of or his divulgence of its knowledge to someone outside the Brotherhood was said to have been so shocking to the Pythagoreans that Hypasis afterwards was said to have drowned at sea apparently as a punishment from the gods for divulging this privileged information, which was seen as impious behavior. This episode is sometimes referred to as the first martyrdom of science. However, we could also think about this person as one of the many martyrs of superstition, since it was not the scientific aspect of irrational numbers that was the root cause of his death, but rather its religious extrapolations that were seen as a threat to the foundation of Pythagorean mysticism. Another legend states that Hippasus was merely exiled for this revelation. Regardless, the discovery of irrationality is not actually specifically ascribed to Hippasus by any ancient writer, and the few ancient sources which describe this story are conflicting. For example, Pappus of Alexandria, a mathematician of the 4th century AD, merely says that the knowledge of irrational numbers originated in the Pythagorean school, while not naming anyone specifically and that the member who first divulged the secret perished by drowning. Alternatively, Iamblichus, a Neoplatonist philosopher of the 3rd century AD, says that Hippasus drowned because he revealed how to construct a dodecahedron, meaning a shape with 12 equal pentagonal faces, inside a sphere, and took credit for its construction himself. So it seems that the tradition was a merging of the two stories together. In principle, the stories can be combined, though, since it is possible to discover irrational numbers when constructing dodecahedrons, as irrationality can be easily seen in the golden ratio of the regular pentagon. Regardless, the irrationality of the square root of 2 must have been discovered around the time that Hippasus lived, because Plato in his Theotetus describes how Theodorus of Cyrene, a little later around 400 BC, proved the irrationality of the square root of 3, the square root of 5, and so forth up to the square root of 17, which implies that an earlier mathematician had already proved the irrationality of the square root of 2. No matter who discovered it, the discovery of irrational numbers and incommensurable ratios posed a very serious problem to Pythagorean mathematics, since it shattered their assumption that numbers and geometry were inseparable, which is a foundation of their theories. This was also indicative of another problem facing the Greeks at that time, that being the relation of the discrete to the continuous. For example, as we discussed in episode 83, Zeno's paradoxes question the conception that quantities are discrete and composed of a finite number of units of a given size. Past Greek conceptions dictated that that necessarily must be, because whole numbers represent discrete objects, and a commensurable ratio represents a relation between two collections of discrete objects. However, Zeno found that, quote, in fact, 
Quantities in general are not distinct collections of units. This is why ratios of incommensurable quantities appear. Quantities are, in other words, continuous. End quote. What this means is that, contrary to the popular conception of the time, there cannot be an indivisible, smallest unit of measure for any quantity. And so, in fact, these divisions of quantity must necessarily be infinite. For example, let's consider a line segment. We can split this line segment in half, then split that half in half, and so forth. This process thus would continue infinitely, as there is always another half to be split. The more times the segment is halved, the closer the unit of measure comes to zero, but it never reaches exactly zero. And so Zeno's paradoxes help to demonstrate the contradictions inherent in the mathematical thought of the time. However, while Zeno's paradoxes accurately demonstrated the deficiencies of contemporary mathematical conceptions, they were not regarded as proof of the alternative, because his disproving the validity of one view did not necessarily prove the validity of another. And therefore, and therefore, further investigation had to occur. That would come from Eudoxus of Cnidos, a student of Archytas and Plato in the 4th century BC, who we will discuss in a future episode. After the initial attacks that saw the death of Pythagoras, Pythagorean communities in Croton and elsewhere continued to flourish. But around 450 BC, commotion ensued in the cities throughout Magna Graecia, in which Pythagorean clubs had been formed. In Croton, a house where Pythagoreans gathered was set on fire, and all but two Pythagoreans were burned alive. Their meeting places in other cities were also attacked, and philosophical leaders killed. As an active and organized brotherhood, the Pythagorean order was everywhere suppressed, and did not again revive, at least not publicly. Known members were put to death or banished. These attacks occurred in the context of widespread violence and destruction in Magna Graecia, which we will discuss in future episodes. Following the political instability in the region, some Pythagorean philosophers fled to mainland Greece, while others regrouped at Regium in southern Italy. The result was that by about 400 BC, the majority of Pythagorean philosophers had left Italy. Still though, the Pythagoreans continued to exist as a secretive sect, the members of which kept up among themselves their religious observances and scientific pursuits, until they would be revived with architists and the so-called New Pythagoreans in the 4th century BC. But for now, we shall leave the Pythagoreans here and move on to discuss some of the non-Pythagorean mathematicians of the 5th century BC. Oenopetus of Chios was an ancient Greek geometer and astronomer who lived around 490 to 420 BC. Very little information is known about his life, though. According to tradition, at some point he traveled to Egypt in order to enrich his knowledge in both geometry and astronomy from some Egyptian priests. It is believed that he also spent some time in Athens, based on Plato mentioning him, but there is only circumstantial evidence to support this. We will discuss his significance as an astronomer on the next episode. But as a geometer, Owen Opetus seems to have been more of a methodologist, who gave himself the task of making geometry comply with higher standards of theoretical purity. In doing so, he introduced the distinction between theorems and problems. Although both are involved with the solution of an exercise, a theorem is meant to be a theoretical building block to be used as the foundation of a further theory, while a problem is only an isolated exercise without further follow-up or importance. As part of these higher standards, Owen Opetus apparently was the author of the rule that geometrical constructions should use no other means than a compass and an unmarked straight edge. In other words, from that point onwards, Greek mathematicians had to just use those two tools as a way of doing proofs in an effort to ensure geometric accuracy. You can easily imagine some mathematician sitting at his work table with a sheet of vellum, which is a writing parchment made from the skin of an animal, as well as a straight piece of wood and a compass with a shallow sharp-edged blade that would score the prepared animal hide. Remarkably, in this way, Greek mathematicians were able to find ways to divide a line into an arbitrary set of equal segments, to draw parallel lines, to bisect angles, to construct many polygons, and to construct squares of equal or twice the area of a given polygon. Three problems proved elusive, though, those being the squaring of a circle, the doubling of a cube, and the trisecting of an angle. These would become known as the great mathematical problems of antiquity, and several ancient Greeks made noteworthy attempts at solving them. Not to be confused with the father of medicine, who we discussed in episode 78, but there was also another, though less famous, Hippocrates in the 5th century BC. This one lived from around 470 to 410 BC, and was born on the island of Chios. 
He may have been a pupil of the mathematician and astronomer, Onipitus of Chios, and his mathematical work seems to suggest that he had Pythagorean influence too, perhaps through contact between Chios and the neighboring island of Samos, which itself was a center of Pythagorean thinking. In fact, Hippocrates has been described as a para-Pythagorean, meaning that he was a philosophical fellow traveler. Regardless, he originally lived as a merchant, but after some commercial misadventures, in which he was robbed by either pirates or fraudulent customs officials, he went to Athens, possibly to engage in litigation against those who wronged him. Apparently, he liked Athens so much that he just stayed, where he eventually became a leading mathematician. His major accomplishment is that he was the first to write a systematically organized geometry textbook called Stoichia, or The Elements, consisting of basic theorems or building blocks of mathematical theory. From then onwards, mathematicians from all over the ancient world, at least in principle, could build on a common framework of basic concepts, methods, and theorems, which stimulated the scientific progress of mathematics. And in the century after Hippocrates, at least four other mathematicians wrote their own elements, steadily improving upon terminology and logical structures. In this way, Hippocrates' pioneering work laid the foundation for the more famous version of Euclid's elements in the late 4th century BC that was to remain the standard geometry textbook for many centuries. We will discuss Euclid and his elements in more detail in a future episode. We are lucky that we have Euclid's elements, though, because only a single fragment of Hippocrates' elements has survived, as it is embedded in the work of Simplicius on his commentaries on Aristotle. However, it is quite famous because in this fragment, we get a glimpse into one man's attempt at tackling one of the major mathematical problems of the time, that being the squaring of a circle. In other words, he was faced with the challenge of constructing a circle with the same area as a square. And thanks to Onipitus, he could only use an unmarked straight edge and a compass. The Mesopotamians, Egyptians, and Indians had attempted at this problem for many centuries before the Greeks had even begun to take a whack at it. In fact, so many mathematicians must have been confounded by this endeavor by the 5th century BC that the problem was even mentioned in Aristophanes' play The Birds by the character Meton of Athens, possibly to indicate the paradoxical nature of his utopian city. Hippocrates' attempt would lead to a new discovery that would come to be named after him as the so-called Loon of Hippocrates. The word Loon derives from Luna, the Latin word for moon, because in geometry, a Loon is the crescent-shaped area, shaped like a crescent moon, hence the name, which corresponds to the area inside just one of two intersecting circles. Hippocrates' Loon is an important special case because it represents the first curved figure to have its exact area calculated mathematically. Some modern scholars also believe that in the process, Hippocrates was the first to prove that the area of a circle is proportional to the square of its diameter. Regardless, Hippocrates showed that certain loons could be exactly squared with a straight edge and compass, and so he wished to apply his new discovery to the larger problem of squaring the circle. His strategy, apparently, was to divide a circle into a number of crescent-shaped parts, if it were possible to calculate the area of each of these parts, then he believed that the area of the circle as a whole could be known too. Of course, Hippocrates and his fellow mathematicians hadn't quite yet figured out what we now know as the numerical value of pi, which is the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle, and also the ratio of the area to the square of the radius. But even after its discovery, the ancients didn't call it pi. That was a name given much later in the 1700s, deriving from the first letter of the Greek word perimetros, meaning circumference. It was also during the 1800s that the approach of squaring the circle was mathematically proven to be impossible, when the numerical value of pi was proven to be a transcendental number, rather than an irrational number, meaning that it is not a root of any polynomial with rational number coefficients. The expression squaring the circle, thus, is sometimes used as a metaphor for trying to do the impossible. Many other ancient Greek mathematicians, though, not only focused on the problem of squaring the circle, but also the larger problem that would ultimately become known as pi. Antiphon, who was known mostly as a sophist, was also a capable mathematician, and alongside his companion, Bryson of Heraclea, they arguably contributed the most during the classical period to solving this age-old problem. While we will talk about Antiphon more in a future episode, very little is known about Bryson. He flourished during the late 5th century BC and may have been a pupil of Socrates, because Theopompus later claims that Plato stole many of his ideas for his dialogues from Bryson. 
He is known mainly from Aristotle, who in his posterior analytics and sophistical refutations, criticizes his and Antiphon's method of squaring the circle. Regardless of Aristotle's criticisms, these two were the first to give an upper and lower bound for the numerical value of pi. They did so by inscribing a regular polygon within a circle and then circumscribing a regular polygon around a circle and finally doubling the number of sides which would eventually fill up the area of the circle. They then could proceed to calculate the polygon's areas, but due to the complexity of the method, they were only able to calculate pi to a few digits. Although Aristotle criticized this method, Archimedes in the 3rd century BC would later use a method similar to that of Bryson and Antiphon. In calculating the perimeters of these polygons, he proved that pi is greater than 223 over 71, or 3.1408, but less than 22 over 7, or 3.1429. Ptolemy in the 2nd century AD gave a value of pi of 3.1416 which it is believed that he obtained from Archimedes. Of course, we now know that pi is approximately equal to 3.14159 with never-ending digits. Still, his polygonal algorithm dominated for over a thousand years, so much so that pi is sometimes referred to as Archimedes' constant. We will discuss Archimedes and his significant achievements much more in a future episode. In addition, three other contributions by Hippocrates in the field of mathematics are noteworthy. First, he is believed to have originated the use of letters to refer to the geometric points and figures in a theorem. For example, triangle ABC represents a triangle with vertices at points A, B, and C. Second, Hippocrates invented the technique of reduction, which transforms specific mathematical problems into more general principles with broader applications, rather than rules with specific uses. The solution to the more general problem not only automatically gives a solution to the original problem, but also is more easy to solve. And third, Hippocrates found a way to tackle the problem of the doubling of the cube. Like the squaring of the circle, this was another of the so-called great mathematical problems of antiquity. According to Plutarch, the problem owes its name to a story concerning the citizens of Delos, who consulted the oracle at Delphi in order to learn how to rid themselves of a plague that had been sent by Apollo. The oracle had responded that they had to build him an altar twice the size of the existing one, which had the shape of a cube. The people of Delos then consulted Plato, who was able to interpret the oracle as the mathematical problem of the doubling of the volume of a given cube. Plutarch, who himself was a priest at Delphi, used this legend to explain why the citizens of Delos occupied themselves with the study of geometry and mathematics in order to calm down their passions. Regardless, it was a mathematical issue well before Plato's time. The Egyptians, Indians, and particularly the Greeks made many attempts at solving what they saw as an obstinate, but ultimately soluble problem. Unfortunately though, their attempts were futile. The first solution that might come to one's mind is to simply double all sides of the altar, but this leads to an altar eight times as big as the original instead of two times bigger. The right way to approach this problem then is to ask what length should each of the sides of the new altar be if one wants to make the volume twice as large as the volume of the original altar. A significant development in finding a solution to the problem was aided by a discovery of Hippocrates who determined in algebraic terms that doubling a cube requires one to determine the value of a cube root, which he ultimately found to be x equals y to the third. Doubling this, then, is about determining the value of the cube root of 2, or x equals 2 to the 1 third, which is also an irrational number. This issue caused in geometry the same perplexity that the square root of 2 had caused, and mathematicians took the issue up and worked on it for centuries, producing a large amount of admirable work. According to Plutarch, Plato gave the problem to Eudoxus, Archytas, and Menachmus, who all solved it, but using mechanical means which earned a rebuke from Plato for not using pure geometry. Menachmus' original solution involves the intersection of two conic curves. Archytas solved the problem in the 4th century BC using geometric construction in three dimensions, determining a certain point as the intersection of three surfaces of revolution. Other more complicated methods of doubling the cube were found in the Hellenistic period, involving Nusus construction by Archimedes, the Sizoid of Diocles, the Conchoid of Nicomedes, or the Line of Philo. We will discuss these more in a future episode. Regardless, these methods all employed more than just a straight edge and a compass. And so mathematicians kept searching for a solution to this problem. And it wasn't until the 1800s that the cube root of 2 was determined to not be a constructible number using only a straight edge and compass. 
This is a consequence of the fact that the coordinates of a new point constructed by a straight edge and compass must be a power of 2. Those generated by the cube root of 2, though, are of a degree of 3. The third of the great mathematical problems of antiquity would be the trisection of an angle. It concerns the construction of an angle equal to one-third of a given angle, or simply state it, to divide it into three equal angles, using only a straight edge and a compass. Although it is relatively straightforward to trisect a right angle, that is to construct an angle with a measure of 30 degrees, in the 1800s it too was proven to be impossible for other arbitrary angles, using only a straight edge and compass. Other methods, including nusus construction, were more successful. It comes from the Greek verb nusain, which means to incline towards, as it consists of a line element that is fitted into two given lines in such a way that the line element passes through a given point. It is originally due to Archimedes and is performed by using a ruler, involving the simultaneous sliding and rotation of a straight edge that isn't unmarked, but has two marks at a set distance apart. Using this method, it was successful to trisect any angle up to 180 degrees. New SACE have been important because they sometimes provide a means to solve geometric problems that are not solvable by means of a compass and straight edge alone, such as the problems of trisecting an angle and doubling the cube. There are two other mathematicians of the 5th century BC that we should mention. The first is Democritus of Abdera. Though he is known mostly for his involvement in the atomist theory, as we discussed in episode 82, he was also a pioneer of mathematics, and geometry in particular. We only know this through citations and other writings of his works, titled On Numbers, On Geometrics, On Tangencies, On Mapping, and On Irrationals, since most of Democritus' large body of work did not survive the Middle Ages. Notable among his mathematical achievements was that he was among the first to observe that a cone in a pyramid with the same base and height has one-third the volume of a cylinder or prism, respectively. Finally, Theodorus of Cyrene lived from 465 to 398 BC. The only first-hand accounts of him that survive are in three of Plato's dialogues, the Theotetus, the Sophist, and the Statesman, and little is known of his biography beyond what can be inferred from Plato's dialogues. He was born in the northern African colony of Cyrene, and apparently taught both there and in Athens. Plato's Theotetus associates him with the Sophist Protagoras, with whom he claims to have studied before turning to geometry. A dubious tradition repeated among ancient biographers, like Diogenes Laertes, held that Plato later studied with him at Cyrene, though it's more likely that the two came into contact in Athens. Theodorus' work is known through a sole mathematical theorem, called the Spiral of Theodorus which is delivered in the literary context of the Theotetus. In the text, his student, Theotetus, attributes to him the theorem that the square roots of all the non-square numbers up to 17 are irrational. Quote, Theodorus here was drawing some figures for us in illustration of roots, showing that squares containing three square feet and five square feet are not commensurable in length with the unit of the foot. And so, selecting each one, in its turn, up to the square containing 17 square feet, and at that he stopped. End quote. Because of this passage, it is assumed that Theodorus had proved that all of the square roots on non-square integers from 3 to 17 are irrational, by means of the so-called spiral of Theodorus, which is composed of contiguous right angles with hypotenuse lengths equal to the square root of 2, the square root of 3, the square root of 4, and so forth, up to the square root of 17, where he stopped because additional triangles caused the diagram to overlap. Plato does not attribute the irrationality of the square root of 2 to Theodorus, though, as it was well known before him, as we have discussed. We will discuss his student, Theotetus, much more in a future episode. Greek mathematicians from Thales onwards understood something that somehow eluded the Egyptians, that being the importance of mathematical rigor. The Egyptians, for example, equated the area of a circle to the area of a square whose sides were 8 ninths of the circle's diameter. From the perspective of this calculation, the value of the mathematical constant pi is 256 over 81. This is a very accurate calculation, around a half percent error, but mathematically incorrect. For the purposes of Egyptian engineering, though, this half percent error was not actually important, otherwise their impressive monuments would have collapsed years ago. However, ignoring this half percent error neglects a fundamental property of the true value of pi which is that no fraction can express it. The Egyptians also rounded up other numbers, such as the value of the square root of 2, 
with a fraction of 7 over 5. By using rounded up values, the irrational nature of these numbers was not noticed by the Egyptians. The Greeks, though, were obsessed with mathematical rigor, and so for them, rounding up was not good enough, as they acknowledged the exactness of the mathematical language. By not giving up in the pursuit of mathematical accuracy, the Greeks developed a mathematical knowledge that is arguably perhaps the most admirable memorial of their intellectual achievements. The mathematical discoveries and establishment of theories by both non-Pythagoreans and Pythagoreans in the 6th and 5th centuries BC set the foundation for many mathematical achievements to occur in the following 4th century BC and into the Hellenistic period, but we will have to continue that discussion in future episodes. On the next episode, we will slightly switch gears and take a look at the works and lives by many of these philosophers and early Pythagoreans in the realm of astronomy. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 86, Early Astronomy. 